Welcome to Identity Unbox, where we provide mentorship and promote representation for Black professionals in the advancement of the Black community. We are seeking guidance from exceptional Black leaders, scholars, and professionals with expertise in their respective fields. We hope to foster a space that promotes authenticity, inclusivity, and restoration for our listeners while exploring the intersection of our personal and professional lives. This project is a culmination of our lived experiences as young Black professionals to transform our life trajectories to overcome adversity and reach triumph. Our intention is to inspire you on your path to discovering your purpose. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Andre Dick, on this episode of Identity Unboxed. Dr. Andre Dick is the Senior Vice President and Surgeon in Chief at Seattle Children's Hospital, um, and his primary office is Seattle Children's Transplant Services. We are very happy to have him here today to share his experience and all the wisdom that he can provide those who are listening. And with that being said, we can get started on our first question. What inspired you to pursue a career in the medical field, and how did your identity as a Black man impact this journey? Uh, thanks for having me here, Brad and Kiana. It's uh, actually an honor to be here to be able to share my um, wisdom experience uh, on my journey uh, so far. You know, my um, I've, I've always been so sort of take it back. I grew up in Jamaica, and I I, I came to New York City for college. Uh, so, you know, while I was in Jamaica, the the education system is a little bit different. You get placed on different pathways very early on. So I was on the science pathway uh, while I was in high school, and uh, you know I did um, I did uh, enjoy that area. Um, the the opportunities there is um, you know it's not as uh, robust as in America, and so you know you become a lawyer, doctor, business person. And um, pilot, those are kind of the sort of the main pathways. Um, and so I, I, I chose to do medicine because I enjoyed the sciences. Um, one of the things that I want people to sort of get from this conversation is, um, you know, um, oftentimes you people think that you do these things and, you know, you're like the top of your class, you do well, there's no setbacks. And actually, that's not true. So I could tell you my personal story. So in Jamaica, we have to, we actually start high school at around age 10 or 11. And um, and then it goes to, you know, I think 10, 10th grade. And there's an optional two years to get to the 12th grade. After, at the end of the 10th grade, you have to take all these exams to, to, to move forward. And you can either move forward there or, you know, try to go to university or do those extra two years. Um you know, for me, those exams actually did not go well. <laughs> did not go well for me. And not not because I I wasn't smart or anything like that. It was just um lack of applying myself uh to the work. And um again, not making any excuses, but just want to make people know that despite those um, challenges or life events that didn't work out the way. It actually was uh, sort of a catalyst for me to sort of button down and say, "Hey, listen, I I can't continue, you know, on this path. You know, I um, I I have a lot more to offer. Um, um, I have a lot more to to give. And um, you know, since that time that that happened, you know, I've been sort of on this path forward. And and the point of the story is that, you know." Don't give up. When things don't go your way, don't give up. You know, you have to see it, see these, uh, these as learning opportunities. And uh, one of the big things for my career, and it took me a while to understand this, is failure is a part of success. You, you, you can't have success without failure. It's pretty much impossible. And so, you know, you know that failure that I had in many ways um, in the earlier part of my career had sort of limited um, the way I thought about things. I would not make, you know, decisions or go after things un unless I was like 80 or 90% sure that it, was, it would be successful. 
And the truth is, you know, you have to go after things, fail and learn quickly and move on, right? You can't let those those kind of um, scenarios or or life events deter you from what you, you know, deter you from what you want to be. So anyway, that being said, you know, I came to New York City and, um, you know, I was living with my mom. It's a hard time for me because we didn't know anyone in, in the city. And uh, except for uh, uh, my mom's cousin took us in uh, when we when we came, when we first came to this country. And um, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a totally different you know, cultural system and even more challenging when you don't know anybody. And uh, for the most part, when I came here for about a year um, because of, you know, lack of doc- appropriate documentation, you know, I, I, I couldn't do anything. So I sat around for a year, kind of just hanging out, trying to help my mom, so on and so forth. And ultimately when things, you know, came through, then I went to college and and, um, you know, in my mind, I was like, yeah, I want to do medicine uh, and, um, you know, um, sort of set myself up to to make sure I, I was, you know, uh, very successful around that. And, um, you know, again, that, that, that also journey was a little bit sort of challenging, but, you know, you know, fortunately, I, I was um, sort of matched my... Um, sort of, I don't know if ambition was the right word, but my drive with opportunities that came along. And I was fortunate to have not just uh, significant mentorship, but also sponsorship, which is something that we don't always talk about. Um, mentorship and sponsorship are two different things. And, uh, you know, fortunately for me, I was able to have good mentors and excellent sponsors that was able to 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 help me on my path to, to medicine. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that's so amazing just to hear your journey about how you continue to hold that hope and have that determination to continue pursuing your goals, even adjusting to a new country and coming here and not really knowing exactly how to uh, figure out how to interact with people from different cultures and just being in the U.S. So I can imagine that was very difficult for you. But I would love if you would speak a bit more to the impact of mentorship and sponsorship, you did mention the difference between the two. And partly why we created this space was to provide that mentorship for our listeners. And I'm not sure many people do know that sponsorship kind of works in tandem with that to really achieve your goals. So if you would speak to that a bit more and um, also explain kind of the definition between um, mentorship and sponsor- sponsorship, that would be amazing. Yeah, you know, I was, um, you know, there's a book, I'm trying to, I was trying to look it up to try to find it yesterday um, that talks about sponsor. He said, forget a mentor, you got to find a sponsor. And a sponsor, you know, is um, is someone who, you know, when the doors are closing and you're not there, you know, they're, they're chanting your name. They're like saying, hey, you know, you know, Tiana is the person for the right job, I'm willing to put my, my name on the line. And, you know, you know, Brad's, Brad's my person. And regardless of whether or not, you know, you succeed or, you know, even when you stumble, they'll say, hey, this could happen to anyone, right? That's what sponsorship is. You know, someone that's invested in your career with nothing, they don't want anything in return, right? They just want to see that you're successful. You know, they provide you access to networks that you would never be able to be a part of or be very hard to sort of break into that. And, you know, they're the ones that are championing your visibility. Like I said, when you're not in the room, they are speaking up for you. That's a little bit different in, in um, you know, mentorship where, you know, the mentor will say, hey, um, for example, you know, Tiana, hey, have you tried to apply and speak at a conference? Uh, you know, and the sponsor would say, I've recommended you for that, right? You just got to show up, I'll put your name in, you're on the list you're good to go. And so again, like you pointed out, you need both, but the most important part of it, especially as you continue to progress through your career, it's the sponsorship that counts. That's what's going to be able to set you apart from, you know, because again, at some, at some level, you're all looking the same, but who's the one that's, you know, with the bullhorn chanting your name, 
you know, set, uh, you know, setting you up for success. And, and, and also more importantly, like, you know, when things don't work or that they, they provide air cover for you, Hey, this could happen to anyone, you know, and, um, and, um, you know, make sure that, you know, no matter what, you know, you're going in the right direction and, you know, they're, they're constantly, constantly, constantly trying to move you forward. And again, I've been very fortunate, you know, for that level of sponsorship. And uh, it has played a tremendous reason why I'm actually, you know, in this in this role. Don't get me wrong; you still got to do the work, right? You still got to do the work. You still got to be excellent at that stuff. And you know, once your sponsors see that in you, they will always, always, always push you forward. And again, it's it's almost as if they're like your parents, right? They'll they'll do they're putting you out there, and not because they want anything in return, but you know, they want to see you succeed and move forward. Thank you so much for speaking on that. I feel like that's really important because it's not something that I thought about much. I always kind of focus on the mentorship aspect, but it is true that, you know, regardless of who you are, people that come from more, you know, that may come from more socioeconomically advantaged backgrounds, they might have those resources or connections already, or they might have, you know, parents with money that can help uplift them. And so those who are coming from disadvantaged backgrounds that don't know anyone who could get them in the room or don't have any of those resources, that's actually very crucial, you know, to have someone who's willing to take a chance on you and to put your name out there um, and who believes in you full steam. So, yeah, I know that's critical. And one of the things that, you know, when I, uh, a good friend of mine, Paris Butler, he's uh, last year DEI at, I believe, at Yale, and he's a plastic surgeon. And he came and gave a talk here and he had this term mosaic sponsorship. Uh, mentorship slash sponsorship and I think it's critical for you to um, what that means is you know when you build your sponsor or what I also term your cabinet of people that are going to support you you know they could come from various different backgrounds they don't have to necessarily look like you or or come from uh, same cultural background you know you you have to you, you learn different things from different people it's kind of like this concept of this diversity of thought, diversity of access that will, 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 will sort of help you move forward. And, and, and I gotta say like, you know, when I first came to this country and I, I went to undergrad, did my second part of my undergrad in Buffalo, you know, my sort of mentor and sponsors were three people that I initially met that exposed me to research and, you know, opportunities to, to get into medicine uh, were three women. Uh, Dr. Gail Wilski, she's my biochemistry professor. Um, um, Dr. Um, Marianne Rokitka, who is my physiology professor, of which I still talk to them today. To this day, that was umpteen years ago, I still talk to them. And another lady, Diane Bowfinger, Dr. Diane Bowfinger, which I worked in her lab, and she gave me my first real exposure to research and doing presentations at, at conferences. And so, you know, Neither of those people were from, you know, my background at all. I mean, they're, one, they're not Jamaican. Two, they're not people of color. And so, you know, but they saw um, something in me that sometimes I didn't see myself. And uh, they were, they invested and, and, and took me under their wings and mentored slash sponsored me until I got into, into medical school and, and continue to do so, you know, today. So try not to sort of limit yourself with, who and what your mentor and sponsor looks like, especially for, you know, people of color. There's very few, uh, you know, at that level to be able to give you that access and exposure. That's such a great advice. Thank you so much for sharing that and also being open to those new connections for people that have unique experiences that may be different from yours, but it can open new pathways that you maybe never experienced. So just being able to have those opportunities is really valuable to advance your career, as you mentioned. And moving forward, um, becoming a surgeon generally takes 13 years, so quite an undertaking, um, starting with obtaining a bachelor's degree, followed by four years of medical school and a minimum of a five-year re residency. What advice do you have for young professionals who aspire to pursue a career in the medical field but are hesitant due to the process generally taking more than a decade to complete? Yeah, it's a very long time. It's a very <laughs> Definitely a very long time. And, uh, you know, if it's something that you really want to do and you're, you're passionate about, 
you know, you should definitely, you know, pursue it and, um, you know, try not to, you know, have anyone sort of detract you from what you want to do. A big thing for me is I tell people is like, you have to determine what success looks like for you. You should never, ever, ever have anyone else determine what success, success looks like for you. Otherwise, you're not going to be happy and, um, you know, you're going to be living someone else's dream. Again, don't get me wrong. You know, there's pointers that you got to take take along the way, but you have to determine what good looks like for you in the end. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be looking at yourself in the mirror like, am I happy with the way my life went? Am I happy with the way my career went? You know, and, and life is, you know, personal and professional. You know, are you happy with that? And so you have to, you have to make that sort of decision for yourself. You know, coming from a, uh, um, as a person of color, you're more likely to, you know, face a lot of sort of socioeconomic challenges. And, you know, I think oftentimes that weigh into the way decisions are made by the individual. And, um, you know, more often than not, you have to help, you know, kind of support your family, you know, as as well as yourself, as you're trying to get your education and you don't necessarily have those resources. And sometimes you get deterred and, you know, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to make those decisions when you're trying to advance your career, but also have, you know, family responsibilities, not necessarily your own child or, you know, wife, or, but you got to help your parents, you got to help your siblings. You know, these are, you know, things that, you know, are more commonly faced by us. And, um, again, try not to make that the trade. You gotta, you just gotta go after what you want to do. And, um, you know, yeah, there's going to be significant sort of loans and, 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 and things to, to, um, at the end of that, but, you know, there's, there's other ways and, and means that, you know, you know, folks are trying to address those issues. You can always get, you know, potential loan forgiveness, you know, if you go into medicine, you know, you know, I know there's a big thing in the news about what, Biden has done and, and uh, you know, to, to forgive those loans and, you know, it's kind of like an uproar from society. But, you know, these are things that, you know, like myself, if I, if I didn't have those opportunities, you know, I probably would not have been able to do this. You know, I was able to get grants from the state, you know, uh, in New York, you know, when I did my undergrad, I got funding from, you know, I just, I, did, I went to a state university the entire time. So it was a lot easier for me to get funding. But, you know, as I look at my nieces and nephews who are now going through college, there's ample opportunity, especially if you demonstrate, you know, a level of, you know, academic excellence. Um, people are looking for, you know, folks like us to, to help support because we are, again, in a minority across all boards, no matter what uh, field that you think about, medicine, law, journalism, all these things. We're, we're kind of a rare breed and, you know, people want to, help support that to, to make a difference. So, and, you know, my big thing was that go after what you want to do. Got to be smart about it. Um, but, and at the same time, you know, look for opportunities that are going to help you. And, and they're there. There are financial resources that are there to help you, you know, um, get through without having significant birds at the, burden at the end. Wow. Thank you so much for that. That is very valuable advice. And I was wondering, you know, just since you actually embarked on that journey, if you could share a little bit more about if you faced any adversity or any tough moments within, you know, that journey where you're like, man, I don't know if I can keep going. Like, this is a long time. It's going to take me forever, you know, and, and what kept you motivated as you went through that? Yeah, it's it's a very long time. And, and, and you know, the challenge is that I face then the challenges never end. I guess I should say, I should say that. So it, it, it doesn't matter if you're the medical student, resident, fellow, faculty, senior vice president, surgeon, achieved. As a person of color, those challenges are not going to change. Right? I, I just want people to understand that. It doesn't matter. You know, unfortunately, this is a it's the society that we live in, and um, but you just got to be focused and 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 try to, um, you know, you're aware of it, but don't let it 
don't let it prevent you from accomplishing what you're trying to accomplish. And, um, you know, for me, the major thing that kept me going through those early years is, you know, I was the one that was going to have to, I talked about this earlier, to provide, to help my mom, to help my sister, um, who were all coming up behind me and, um, you know, to help support them, right? You know, essentially my mom came here in her, you know, mid-40s to restart. That's a very challenging thing to do. Move to a whole new country and not just restart, but, you know, restart from the bottom. You know, you know, she's, you know, she has a high school level education. And so when you come here, you essentially got to restart from the bottom. So, you know, she is clearly the visionary and, you know, anything that I've accomplished through my life, you know, her name should be right there. Visionary, she made significant sacrifices for me and my sister to be where we are today. And so that is the thing in my mind that I had no safety net, right? Safety net was me. And so I couldn't stop. No matter what challenge I face, I still had to keep going. I, I could not stop, right? Because there was a lot sort of riding on me being successful in my role. And whether or not I sort of, you know, made that up in my head, but that's how I felt. And that's what, you know, um, sort of propelled me and had this persistent and consistency in, you know, always moving forward. That's what, that's what kept me going. That is so remarkable and just impressive to see that your mom was able to sacrifice so much for you all and allow you to have, you know, the chance to really achieve your dreams. So that's just so great. So thank you for um, sharing that. And I was hoping you would go back to uh, that idea that you talked about when you were speaking of success and defining that for yourself. And I was hoping if you would be able to um, share how you have kind of cultivated success in your own life and um, any tips that you have for others that are unsure about what that looks like for them. Yeah, it took me a while to understand what, what that meant. And, um, you know, people tell you, you know, this is the only path you can take, right? This is what you have to do. And, and I, and for the most part, I think most of the time people have your best interests at heart. Um, and that's what they have done to be successful. But, um, sometimes you know, when what you want to do doesn't match with what, you know, all the others want you to do, and then you sort of come on this kind of friction, that's when you, you know, you kind of understand whether or not you have sort of a true mentor or sponsor, uh, because no matter what, you know, that person should always want you to be successful in whatever path you want to take. And so, you know, for me, as a surgeon, yeah, I truly enjoy operating. It's, I think it's, I believe it's a privilege. People entrust their little kids for me to, to operate on. And, you know, that's significant trust, right? I, I completely enjoy that. I really enjoy working with kids. Um, I believe that kids are future and, um, you know, you have to support and make sure that you're successful in whatever, whatever means. And at the same time, you know, that's just the kind of surgical part of it. Another part of me was I've always been interested in how can I bring people together, you know, lead a large group? How can I impact change on a much bigger level? And so that's one of the reasons why, you know, I went back and did my public health degree at Harvard. And it totally changed the way I, I thought about medicine. It totally changed the way I practice medicine, which a lot of times was not necessarily in alignment with what, you know, the sort of standard surgical um, practices. And, um, you know, for me, and maybe it's sort of my lived experience or my background, I was able to see other things that, you know, wasn't, you know, at, at that time necessarily um, brought into you know, um, what a successful operation looks like. And uh, let me give you an example. You know, I can do the best technical 
operation on a, on a transplant and the whole thing falls apart because you don't take into consideration all the other things that, you know, the patient needs to follow up, you know, they need to have the nutrition, they need to have, you know, they shouldn't be making choices between, should I take my anti-rejection meds or do I need to pay for food? So, you know, a lot of these things are in, in terms of around social determinants of health, even with, you know, now it's a big, you know, it's a big thing and it's, but even way back when, when I was at Harvard, they talked a, about that a lot. And so when I came back and I was looking at how we did things for patients and families, you know, it's totally different. You have to think about all the upstream things and try to mitigate them as much as possible before you get to the end point. And again, again, doesn't matter how great a surgeon I am or anyone is, if you don't take those things into account, the whole thing will, will sort of fall apart. And so, you know, this platform as Surgeon in Chief has allowed me uh, the ability to to act on that a little more, right? Um, and it's been a great experience and opportunity um, to, to do that. And, you know, you know, I, I tell people if I can make, if I can move the needle even an inch in terms of the ability to have um, closer to health equity, then I've had a successful career. And, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a great opportunity. It, it's a, it's a, um, it's a great, um, um, way to try to, to try to make things better. And, you know, we often talk about these social determinants of health and, you know, it's important and upstream, upstream of my actual operation. I also believe that you have to think even further upstream of social determinants of health. How did we get there? It just didn't happen, you know, by happenstance or out of the blue or something in nature. You know, there are decisions made that created, you know, these social determinants of health that led to health inequity. And, you know, I, I recently saw a talk um, as I attended the Children's Hospital Association meeting um, by this uh, Daniel Dawes. Um, you should look him up. He has this great book that talks about the political determinants of health. And what that means is, for example... You know, we have a lot of um, sort of residential segregation. What I mean by that, redline it, right? These are all political decisions that have been made that impacts, you know, people of color, people with low socioeconomic status that has limited your access to, you know, to health, uh, education, well, all these things impact your 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 outcome, and so yeah, it's good to talk about social determinants of health, but we also need to you know take a step back and realize that there are, there are policies that are put in place that leads to social determinants of health, and we need to re-engineer those policies to reverse a lot of those you know a lot of those things that are, and that these things are hardwired right, they're hardwired into the system, and. Um, you know, it's fascinating. They're almost perfect, right? I mean, there are these things, these things that are hard. You will always get the same outcome. It doesn't matter the color of your skin, what language you speak. If those things are applied to you, you will always get the same outcome. And I think we need to, as a society, to re-engineer that process. Use the same process, get it all hardwired, but make sure that it's, you know, it's equitable to everyone. And, you know, people often talk about this, and often when I say this, privilege, right? And especially when you talk with, you know, my conversations with, you know, some of the majority, and I bring up the term, hey, you're privileged. They get upset at me. They get, you know, it's like a triggering word. And I actually don't mean it in a, in a bad or negative way. I, you, Brad, want that same privilege, Right? We want to enjoy that same privilege so that we can have the same outcome. That's 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 all I, you know, want and that's what everyone wants, right? So it's not necessarily a bad term. You know, we're in a society that, you know, these privileges are, you know, 
to the majority goes unrecognized, but you can, or lived experience teaches us that way that we don't have that privilege. And we're, I'm, I'm not trying to be a, a victim of anything. It's just what it is, right? It's just what it is. And you have to, to reverse a lot of those things to try to get to equity, to get to a better place, to evolve our society. And, and, and so that, you know, everyone can be successful. Thank you so much for that. That was like a wealth of knowledge. And I totally agree. I do feel that sometimes people kind of get offended by the word privilege. But one thing we have to realize is we all have certain privileges. You know, I have the privilege of being able bodied. I don't have any physical disabilities. So I don't have to think about walking up the stairs and those little things. You know, I have the privilege of having an education. A lot of people don't have that privilege, even though it came with the student loans. And so I think it's important for us to recognize that just because in certain demographics, you have privilege does not, you know, it's, that's not a necessarily a bad thing, but it's about how do we advance equity to make sure that everybody has equal access and equal opportunity. And I really appreciate you touching on the social determinants of health and just how race intersects with that. I mean, I don't think a lot of people realize that Today, most neighborhoods in America are still racially concentrated, uh, you know, due to redlining, like you said. And, you know, even when it comes down to like environmental justice, you know, neighborhoods that are predominantly, you know, comprised of people of color are in more polluted areas and that more air pollution. And then that in turn affects health and food deserts, you know, not a lot of, you know, access to healthy food and income. And I think we see those disparities when it came to like the COVID-19 pandemic and um, you know, the disproportionate deaths. Um, and so I would love it if you could elaborate more on the social determinants of health than the intersection of uh, race and just how it leads to disparate health outcomes. Yeah, and I, I just want to make sure that people understand this too. It's like, again, it doesn't matter your race, your language, what you look like. If you apply those determinants, you will always get the same outcome. And I'll give you an example. Here at Seattle Children's, we launched this, you know, program to to collect data uh, on you know nutrition um, um, and access to healthcare. You know, parts of the social determinants of health um, data. And initially, when we launched, people were saying, "Hey, you got to collect it in X population or Y population." And you know, I said, "No, we should just collect it on on everyone." And um, what we realized that 30% of the people who were impacted by social determinants of health uh, were Caucasians, right? And and that goes back to what I'm, I'm, I'm saying is that, you know, yeah, while people of color, language other than English, and other marginalized population are more likely to be impacted by that, it just, it's just crazy to just again say that if you apply this to anyone they will have the same you know sort of outcome and so I, I think it's very important to to make sure that we address these disparities uh, that exist and um and and sort of and, and and be intentional about it as you said you know these social determinants of health um where it's you know access to you know you talked about food deserts access to education access to health you know, if you don't correct those things, you know, we in America, the healthcare system, just at baseline, is a significant portion of our GDP, right? Significant portion. And as long as you continue to have these health inequities, if you transpose that 20 years from now, it's going to be even larger, right? It's, it's going to be a larger portion of our GDP. Part of the reason is also the demographics of our country are changing, right? You know, by 2040, it's projected that we are no longer going to be the minority, right? And if you continue to have these systems and structures in place that negatively impact us now as a minority group, imagine what that's going to look like and how it impacts the country in general, right? It will hold us back from, you know, trying to lead the world in all these other areas because we don't have the right people. We don't have healthy people. We, you know, you know, we have, you know, we don't have people to fight in our, our military or to advance our technology because, you know, 
we're unhealthy, we're dying younger, right? And so I think it's, a, I, I, I should say, I think I know it's important that we do need to address, you know, these issues around social norms. You know, and right now there's significant pushbacks, as you can see, there's a lot of states that are putting up all these laws and anti-DEI and all these other things that, which, you know, doesn't necessarily make any sense. Again, that's my my personal opinion, but I think it's more so more important, more so now than ever, to to address these issues because in the end, it's going to impact our entire country in a negative way at large. It's not just a small population that are being impacted; it translates into other aspects of our country that you know. Then it'll be very hard for us to, you know continue to be the leader of the you know free world. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you speaking about how your lived experience has guided your career and also that it's necessary for us to be in these positions as you stated because often people do disregard those social determinants of health and political determinants of health and they don't understand the cascading effects of what these systems have done to advantage some and disadvantage others and I am just very grateful that you brought up that everyone deserves to have equal opportunity, but it's more than just providing the opportunity. It's also about providing the resources that are necessary and getting to the root cause, understanding how some of these inequities have been baked into the system. Why is that? And it's going to take so many different um, you know, industries convening to work these issues out, um, such as our you know, political system and other Um, people that are in positions of power to bring awareness to that. So I really appreciate you um, touching on those points. Yeah. One thing I saw this thing, um, I think it's, I think I'm saying it's not name, right? Hill Harper, Harper Hill is a movie star, right? And he was talking about um, the the U.S. Senate. And he said, there's a hundred people in the U.S. Senate. People talk about the presidency and so on and so forth. But these are the hundred people that makes decisions about the, I think he said it was a couple trillion dollars that the U.S., you know, had the ability to appropriate, you know, it could be to wars, it could be to education, it could be to poverty. And, um, you know, these are these are the people that ultimately make the decisions. And, you know, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, shouldn't vote, shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. You got to do that, right? Because these are people that are ultimately going to be making the decisions how it impacts you as an individual and us as a society. And uh, the only way, again, as I talked about, to reverse some of these things, you have to have people who are there sitting at the table, making a decision and advocating to make sure that you get, you know, the the necessary equitable resources so that everyone can sort of live their best and, you know, and, and, and fulfill their, their life dreams. And so, I think it's very important to to make sure. And that's why, you know, I sort of tie that back to this political determinants of health. Social determinants of health didn't just come on its own. There are policies that are made and put in place uh, to to then get this outcome that then further impacts us uh, downstream. And, and oftentimes people talk about race, and especially when they do the, all these studies, and, and I tell them race has nothing to do with it, right? Race has... You know, very minimal to do with it. It's decisions that are people that have made. And like we see at Seattle Children's on me, we ask these questions of everyone. 30% of people who are not minorities, who are not people of color, or don't speak different languages, are also impacted because of the same conditions that exist. So I just want to make sure that, you know, that message also gets across. Absolutely. That's an amazing point. And you know, I through having other conversations, I think it speaks to that broader point of, you know, when people see us trying to push for equity for people of color and for black people in particular, people often think, oh, you know, why are we helping black people and not other people? But what people don't realize is the same issues that impact black people also impact white people. And so yeah. when you uplift people at the bottom, it's going to uplift everybody. Yeah. You know? You know, when we think of like student loans, if we had, you know, more opportunities for 
you know, grants or even free education in our country, that would not only help all the, you know, socioeconomically disadvantaged people that are going to be disproportionately burdened, but it would also help other people who may have not had that same struggle that now have even more of an access to that education because of that. And so just because you uplift those that are marginalized and at the bottom of the totem pole doesn't mean that that won't trickle back up. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you so much. And I think that's a good way to kind of pivot back to your personal journey um, and how you navigated your medical career. Um, you filled your residency, you fulfilled your residency at the Pennsylvania State University Hershey Medical Center. Can you share more about this experience and how it prepared you for your career as a surgeon? Yeah, uh, you know, the eight at Penn State was, um, have you been to Hershey, Pennsylvania? I have not. Yeah, it's, um, it's different, <laughs> a lot different than now. Uh, anywhere else I've, I've, I've lived and, um, it's, um, maybe things have changed since I left, but it's, it's not diverse at all. It's not diverse at all. Um, um, it's probably a little bit more diverse than it would be at baseline because the medical center draws in a lot of, of people from all over the place. But, you know, when I started there, um, you know, there were very few, minorities, even in the, in the, even in the surgical, uh, discipline. And it was very, it was very challenging, you know, for me, for sure. And don't get me wrong. I had a great, um, education there. They taught me a lot, um, good surgical skills. I met uh, my wife there. I met, um, uh, uh, one of my mentors I sponsored that, uh, to this day, I still go to go on vacation with him and his family. So. Don't get me wrong. There's this, this, there's there are positive things that came out of me being there, but you know, I also have to share some of the, you know, personal challenges. And it wasn't specific to me. It was also if you talk to my friends, who were also people of color there, um, they had the sort of the mirror image of you know of of some of the challenges that that I had. So it wasn't. You know, someone targeted, say, you know, I'm going to go after Andre. It was just the fact that I was different or we were different. And it was, you know, a majority um, uh, Caucasian population. And um, it was hard. It, it was very hard. You know, you know, people say to me, if you survive in New York City, you can survive anywhere. And I would say, yeah, no. If you survive Hershey, Pennsylvania, as a, you know, person of color, you can, you can survive anywhere. And, um, you know, I think lots of good lessons that, that I learned there, you know, you have to be persistent. There's going to be a lot of, um, um, you know, trying to see how to say this, you know, barriers or challenges that you're going to face that your counterpart will not face, you know, will not face at all. And, um, you know, you often have to wonder, like, you know, why, why are these, why are these things happening? It shouldn't, you know, or, you know, people, you know, never see, even you come in with a white coat, you know, you're, you're the transport guy, not the guy that's here to, you know, perform a surgery. And again, a lot of those things, you know, they've gotten sort of less and less. And maybe because I'm, I'm now living in Seattle, it's a little bit different. Um, but those things are, it, those things still exist, but it was, for me, it was very pronounced in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And um, again, I'm not trying to badmouth the place or the program. It's just, that was my lived experience. That was my lived experience with my roommate, who was not an interventional cardiologist. That was a lived experience that my other, uh, you know, black intern that came in with me as a, you know, spine surgeon. We've all been successful. But it was it was it was a very challenging time there, um, and uh, uh, in terms of the kind of social aspect and you know interacting with various people, and you know there 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 are some people that were you know they were very nice they they, they kind of saw me for who I was, um, you know not necessarily oh this is you know this is a black guy is different, they, they actually saw me for you know, the content of my character, what I brought and what I was trying to do, what I was trying to accomplish. And we were, you know, you know, 
how I treated other people. So that experience, you know, helped me dealt with further challenges after I left. But to be honest, I think if I didn't have that experience, I'm not sure. Maybe I wouldn't have gotten as far as where I am today because you had to navigate significant, you know, challenges while you were there. I mean, it was significant challenges. Thank you so much for sharing those experiences. And I'm sure that was very difficult, as you mentioned, just trying to not only adjust to that environment, but also to demonstrate that you're capable and that you have gone into this space because you are qualified, you are knowledgeable and that you put in the work. So that can be one of the hardest, you know, parts of showing up into these institutions that haven't included us historically and feeling like, do we actually belong? But I really appreciated that point where you talked about how you just continue to show up and, you know, that it is necessary to share these experiences that you have so that these institutions can improve to better meet the needs of students like you. And hopefully that with you bringing up these experiences, that will allow them to understand, um, you know, those challenges that you are encountering. Because a lot of times I don't think, you know, these is predominantly white spaces actually know what we do encounter because we kind of compartmentalize um, a lot of it. So just to survive. So I uh, just appreciate you being vulnerable and bringing that up. And and also don't let it stop you because as I said earlier in the, in the interview, those things don't stop. doesn't matter what title you have. <laughs> those things don't stop. They're always going to think um, that, you know, you don't belong. Always going to think you don't belong. And I, and yeah, I had a recent experience where, you know, I, I had to have a difficult conversation with someone and, and, and um, you know, the kind of response that I got, which was very surprising, was, you know, essentially said that I failed up into my, into my role here. And, you know, I wasn't surprised, you know, and as I tell the story to, you know, my close friends and, and other people, they're like, oh my God, I can't believe, you know, other people are like, oh, I can't believe, I can't believe this was said to you. But I said, you know, I wasn't surprised. It didn't call me, it didn't catch me off guard because it's standard work, right? It's just what it is, whether I was the undergrad medical student resident, fellow faculty, there was always this sort of undercurrent of you don't belong. And so, again, you just got to be, you know, consistent in your actions and just keep going because, you know, if you if you let these things um, throw you off, there's so much things that are, are always coming at you that, you know, you'll, you'll never make it. You'll never make it. Again, you, you capture it but in the box, like you said, you compartmentalize it and then you just keep moving on and you use that as as a learning experience. And sometimes as a reminder that, you know, you always have to go above and beyond your entire life. From the time from the time you come out come into this world un- until the time you leave, you always have to be above and beyond. There's no room for failing up. Or slip in, you just you just you just have to be, and and don't let that deter you. Right, it's a good thing. Don't let that deter you. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. You know, it's um, it's um, it's challenging. And you know, when this whole George Floyd thing came, there was an email sent around acknowledging the situation and how terrible it was, and you know, people said they couldn't believe you know, um, this was happening. And and I and I remember re- replied to that email, you know, just at work here, at the University of Washington. And I said, Hey, you know, like I'm not sure why people are surprised. This is standard work, right? And people kept saying, Oh, you know, it's different, you're a professor, you're this, you're that. And I said, you know, when I leave the walls of the University of Washington or Seattle Children's or whatever institution it is, no one really cares what title you have. No one. 
They act based on what they see, right? They act based on what they see. And what they see is person of color, right? And so almost immediately they're, you know, whatever biases or whatever that comes up, this is what you have to navigate. You know, normally, you know, I'd be in a bow tie and stuff and jacket, and that's, that's, that's the way I dress, right? And two reasons. I like looking good, but it also, I'm trying to mitigate what people are thinking of me when they see me, right? So I'm in a nice jacket, bow tie, and, you know, it doesn't take away all the other stuff, but at least it may blunt some of those things that are, that are coming at me that, you know, you, I, Brad, are constantly sort of navigating. And, you know, <clears throat> simple things as when I don't dress like that and I come in, you know, for example, on the weekends, you know, I can see the interactions are different. People are looking at me sort of differently and asking questions. And I'm like, it's me, it's Andre. I've seen you, I've talked to you before. It's the truth, you know, but you have to be able to constantly mitigate, navigate as you drive from home to work. <clears throat> That's not like a carefree drive. It, anything can happen, <clears throat> right? Anything can happen. And again, I'm not trying to paint this sort of negative picture and, and, and uh, I'm just trying to paint, this is the reality of who we are or lived experience and what we're constantly sort of thinking about as we try to navigate all these spaces. You walk into a room and making sure that, you know, people see you as you, you're the, you're the professional, you're the professor, you're here, you're, you know, you, you have to do that almost all the time, almost all the time. You constantly got a code switch, you, you know, you got to do all these things. None of this, these things should be new to what I'm telling you, but, you know, I want people to understand and hear and 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 and, and try to put themselves in your shoes of what that feels like, what that looks like. Wow, thank you. That resonated with me so much. And it's mentally taxing to always have to censor your appearance and, you know, convince people that you really belong. And I think you, you know, spoke to that very well. And um, you know, even just that experience you talked about showing up on the weekends, like not in your suit and tie and people already have these preconceived notions of you. And, you know, you've been there, you're like, I know, we, you know, you know me and we've spoken before, um, yet they're kind of minimizing your qualifications and um, just who you are. So, yeah, it's definitely something that we constantly have to think about everywhere we go and um, yeah, it's something that we shouldn't have to do, but I think it's great that you do speak to that because we have spoken about this um, in previous episodes about code switching and how we have to always go into these spaces and kind of be hyper vigilant about who's around and if they really want us there and if they're really taking what we're saying to heart or um, listening to us fully. So um, thank you for that. And also you spoke to an important point about um, how people will kind of consider you a, a DEI hire, which is some inflammatory rhetoric that we've seen, um, you know, just recently. So it's how timely that we're having this conversation where you're talking about, like, we have to vote. You know, we have to use our voices because no matter what you do, you show up twice as hard, you know, twice and do twice as good and work twice as hard as everyone else. It's like there's no margin for error for us or immediately you're disqualified. So. I, yeah, I just thank you for bringing that up because we need, we need to talk about it, especially with this upcoming election. Yeah, for sure. Very critical. Yeah, hey. that, yeah that was amazing. I remember um, reading a book by James Baldwin, I believe it was called, and this is off the top of my head, I believe it was called The Fire Next Time. It's been years. Amazing book. One of the yeah. best books I've ever read. Yeah. And he, he talked about, you know, just that, you know, rage, just the, I believe he talked about the black rage and how we, you know, sometimes we walk around like subconsciously knowing what others are thinking of us. Like when we go to a, a store, you know, we kind of know what people are going to think uh, just based on what they see on the outside, you know? And so we kind of walk around with this subconscious knowing of, oh, you know, people only judge by what they see most of the time. So as black people in America, we're kind of walking around with this subconscious knowing of, you know, when I walk around, I have to present myself this way because 
this is what people see and this is how they're going to view me uh, off the bat, regardless of who I am, because all they know is what they see. And so I forget exactly how he phrased it, but that just popped into my mind, you know. Yeah. You'd be 100 uh, this this year. I think he just turned, if he was alive, he'd be 100 years old. So I've been listening to some of his uh, some of his stuff. But yeah, fire next time. It's a, a guy was ahead of his time. A lot of things that he said then, unfortunately, is still applicable today. Definitely. Yes. Everyone needs to read works by James Baldwin. So appreciate you bringing that up, Brad. Um, Critical reading for sure. And then moving forward, I know Dr. Dick, you already spoke a bit about kind of the financial burden of financing medical school. Um, According to the education data initiative, the average student debt for medical students is $202,995 as of 2023. This does not include debt accumulated from pre-medical undergraduate coursework and other educational debt. I would love if you'd be able to share some advice you have for aspiring medical students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged and worry about pursuing medical school due to the financial burden of student loans. And I know you kind of spoke to that already um, and how you've gotten some grants and you went to a state institution, but is there anything else that you would like to share with those listeners that they come from that disadvantaged background and they're kind of like, I don't want to do, you know, 10 years education and take on hundreds of thousands of debt. Um, but yeah, you'd speak more to it. Yeah. Again, I, I just reiterate that you have to take advantage of the, the, the things that are out there in terms of financial support. And again, I, you know, it, you know, with the academic excellence, um, there are plenty of things out there, um, um, that will help you. You may not completely eliminate it, but will help offset some of those, you know, economic challenges at the end. And you gotta be smart about it and, you know, you know, in terms of finance, there's something that I think we should teach our kids from a very young age because, you know, I didn't learn a lot of these things until I was in almost finishing residency. I just, all of my family knows the stuff. There's no, there's no exposure to it. And um, I remember this one event, a very close friend of mine during residency, you know, where it's, I don't know why, what it came up. We were talking about finances and uh, they talk about, he is like, oh, and I have, you know, whatever, X amount of money in my IRA. And my response was like, why are you funding terrorists? Right? Because I was thinking that group, the, and he's like, no, well, you know, like, yeah, like you're laughing. He's laughing at me. Like, what are you talking about, dude? I just didn't know any of this stuff. Right? And uh, I think, um, you know, which is, I think, I know, you know, Finance, financial literacy is a key thing. You got to teach us stuff from your know, young age to, you know, high school, college. If you're going to medical school or law school, whatever, you have to have some baseline because baseline financial literacy. Because otherwise, you know, you'll make a lot of mistakes. Again, for example, yeah, when I became an attendant, the amount of money I was making compared to anyone in my family was tremendous. To, to to me that was like, oh my God, this is this is great. I could do X, Y, and Z, make dumb decisions and, and incur more debt, which when you look at your your counterparts, you know, they're investing and doing all these things and you're like, what the you know, while, you know, trying to get this nice car or like in this nice apartment. No. They were thinking about compound interest and all these things. So, you know, finan- financial literacy is a key to it. And I think that's why you know, oftentimes we miss out on these opportunities that could help fund or or education and 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 try to offset some of those debts is because we just don't know. We don't have the access or exposure to it, or no one's, you know, no one's, you know, trying to teach us about these things. So I think you know, trying to learn that stuff either on your own or I mean, there's plenty of things out there. You know, talk to other people, talk to your guidance counselor. You know, talk to there. There are people there that are. You know, you know, there to help you with his finances to make sure that you you make very good decisions. Um, you know, as you as you embark on this and this journey, and again, a lot of it is you're gonna have to be able to have this sort of deferred gratitude, right? You you can't you know squander these opportunities and and end up in debt where you're you you can't get out of it, right? Like it's just impossible to sort of get out of these things. And you know, I just 
finished paying off my student loans two years ago. This is crazy, right? No, I know I should sell it, you know, exactly. I should celebrate that, but that is almost 20 years post medical school, right? And so it has significant impacts on, you know, it's almost as if you're starting off a mortgage even before, you know, you even purchase a house. And so those have significant, uh, you know, implications. It's an important point that you bring up, especially with the black community not being well versed in, you know, financial literacy, as you said. So it's important to think about that long term goal and, you know, that compounding interest and investing and, you know, not always splurging on those like luxuries, like you said, when you're making kind of that big money in comparison to the rest of your family, it's like, you that's, you know, new kind of new wealth. And you're feeling like I have all this money to spend. But you know, really, you had so many familial obligations, as you mentioned, just kind of pulling your family up. So you have to think about that. Um, and kind of that, you know, you're the first one to maybe even build that generational wealth. So just even paying attention to that even more and kind of being scrupulous about where you are putting your money is necessary. So yeah, thank you for that. And then moving forward, um, I know we're running over time and we do this a lot. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, but I would just love to ask you um, about kind of how you manage uh, mindfulness and mental health, self-love out of work. I know that, you know, being a surgeon, I'm sure it could be very emotionally taxing at times. And that's definitely a profession where you have to be so precise and, you know, very attentive to your work. And I'm sure like mentally prepared. So um, how do you practice mindfulness outside of work? Yeah, I don't, I don't do a very good job of that. And to be honest, <laughs> I, I probably, I need to be, a lot of these things um, you need to be more intentional about. And, um, you know, this tract in medicine and, and surgery is probably extreme. You make a significant amount of sacrifices, personal sacrifices um, to yourself as well as to your family. And, um, you know, sometimes you just have to do those things to, to, um, to get to where you need to. And at some point you, um, you know, you cannot continue to make those sacrifices your entire life. You just, you just can't, right? Because, you know, then when the dust settles and you look around, you got to be all alone. And you may try to, you know, blame the circumstances around you, but, you know, when you're looking in the mirror and you're there by yourself, there's only one person that's going to be accountable for that. You cannot blame others and and so you have to be very intentional about taking care of yourself um taking care of your family and the same intentionality that you spend to build your professional career you have to spend that building your personal stuff that's your true legacy that's the way and again this is just personally for me that's where your true legacy lies at the end of the day you know if I drop that now, you know, the hospital's not going to, I mean, it's going to keep moving, right? The people that's going to be impacted the most is, you know, my wife and my two kids. So you got to put that time in. And uh, and especially for people of color, you know, we're dying at a much younger age, right? Just, just at baseline, we're dying at a, a much younger age. So, you know, to be able to, to last as long in these very stressful career, you got to take care of yourself. And, um, you know, again, if you ask my wife, yeah, I, I've, I've failed at that for sure. And that's something that I actually do need to pay attention to, but you need to be around to enjoy the fruits of your, your labor. It's, it's very important. And, you know, I try, you know, more so now than in the past, I have a little bit more control over that. And so I try to, you know, with all my my son's soccer games, when we go on vacation, we try to go away and try to disconnect from work, um, and, and and try not to let it consume you because you know you can't let work define who you are. You gotta work, you gotta do your best when you're there, but it's you know work isn't you know this job is not who I am. It's what I do. Who I am, it's myself, my family wife, my kids, that's who I am. You, you, I can't stress that enough. You got to take care of yourself. It's, it's, it's so 
crucial. Thank you so much. That's very important, you know, taking care of yourself. You know, you can't help others or it's hard to help others if you don't help yourself. And that starts with showing yourself that love and compassion so that you can pour it into others. So thank you so much for that. And I think that really leads well into our last question that we ask all of our guests. Um, you know, we asked you in the first question how your identity as a black man impacted your journey. So, you know, we want to know what does blackness mean to you? And how has blackness defined you and your journey? Yeah, I don't I don't think I answered that question in the beginning that you asked. And and, and for me, it takes back so growing up in Jamaica, this block this concept of black as an identity, everyone uh, well, not everyone. Majority of the people around me were black. So it wasn't my teachers, my, you know, my doctors, everyone. So to me, that wasn't, that wasn't an issue, right? I, I truly didn't understand what racism meant until I came here. And it took me a while to understand that. Cause I remember when I went to college, you know, I just was studying because as, as I said before, I'm the safety net. I got to accomplish this. And I would hear my fellow um, people of color say, oh, no, the, you know, the man this, the man that. I, that concept was just not there because my whole life, until I was 16 or 17, I was growing up in Jamaica. It's like, yeah, you got you can do this, look around you. This is, the, you know, this is what it is. And uh, it, it took me a while to, to finally understand. And I guess I had to garner that experience to now truly understand what it meant. And we've talked about it quite a lot throughout this, um, throughout this you know, conversations that we've had. And so, again, in some ways, I think because I, I came into that system at a later stage, it did not impact me as much as being born into that system. And, um, and, and, uh, and I, I, I saw how it, you know, impacted others or others around me, people of color around me who, who have been into that system. And, um, you know, it's, it's helped me to think about things a little bit differently and how do I help others who are, you know, currently in the system to say, you know, how do you sort of navigate that path? And it's interesting back to your, the last question about blindness. I think that's a, that's a broad term that, that to me, that's an, that's an individual thing. It, 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 it's interesting, like people just apply it universally with a broad stroke. So oftentimes people would say, you know, when I went to do anything, they say, you're African-American. I'm not African-American. I was born in Jamaica. I'm a naturalized citizen of the country, but I'm not, I'm not African-American. So like, you know, to me, that blackness for me is I eat a lot of curry chicken and jerk chicken and oxtail. That's not just because I'm black. It's not the same experience that I have with Tiana or Brad, right? Yeah, we do have some shared, for sure, some shared experiences, but in terms of that sort of cultural piece, it's different, right? I play dominoes differently than I, I learned to play dominoes here, you know? And so, you know, for me, it's, 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 it's a, it's an individual thing. And, and I think it's good to, to try to preserve that, but also share that because we can learn from, from each other and, you know, and, and, and together be sort of a, a stronger force, right? You know, there was a lot of these kind of weird competitions, you know, you're Jamaica, you're Caribbean, you're African, African American and all these kind of weird dynamics in, in between. And you're like, wait a minute, like, listen, we're all in this together, right? We, yeah, we have shared, you know, different backgrounds, but we have a shared experience that, you know, coming together, helping each other. Um, you know, like you said, it's the tide that rise, raises all the boats and we have to come together. And, you know, so for me, it's, um, I think I was in college when someone said to me, like you're not black enough. I never understood that. I, I don't know why you would have to say that to any person. You're not black enough. But as I reflected through the years, what that meant was, is that my 
sort of cultural upbringing was different than another person of color's upbringing. And so while there are things that they engage in that I didn't, then they saw me as, you know, not black enough. But I'm telling you, you know, when you, when you leave the walls of the institutions or where we, you know, no one really cares. All they see is, you know, a person of color. And, uh, and, uh, and I hope we, we continue to, to move beyond that because, um, you know, there's so much richness and experience that can be shared and, 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 and sort of help each other be successful than to get into this, you know, you're not black enough, you're not this, you're not that, you know, that's, that's kind of wasted energy and you just need to put sort of the positive things in place and focus on those things and, and, and try to evolve and get to a better place. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. And I think it's so significant that you spoke to how vast the community is. And yes, we are seen as black and there's so many shared ties, but we all have different cultural influences. And even, you know, within the black community, there's so many different subcultures. Like you said, like you're Jamaican and you think of your blackness in that context, but for black Americans and African Americans, you know, we think of blackness in a different context because we had to create our own culture you know, many of us as descendants of slavery here in a new environment. But when you are coming up in these different environments, you know, you associate um, your blackness to different, you know, connotations, whether that's positive or whether that's related to the struggle or oppression. So for you to speak to that and just talk about, you know, how you were having to kind of acclimate to that in the U.S., it was very interesting and um, poignant, I believe, for people to truly understand the complexity within our community, because, um, as you said, like blackness, it is an individual thing. And so that's why we ask every single guest um, to really speak to what it means to them. So thank you very much. Yeah, it's, we're, we're not a sort of, as, as you're pointing out, a sort of monolithic group, right? We're, yeah, we're all part of the spectrum, even though we have this shared um, level of experience. Um, you know, there's, there's, um, there's, yeah, there, there's great, there's value in that, right? There's diversity of thought diversity of experiences that, you know, you know, can make us, you know, much stronger, put us in a, in a, in a, in a better light. And, um, yeah, you know, I, I learned a lot from, again, I was from Jamaica, you know, I didn't listen to rap at all. All I listened to was reggae. <laughs> now, you know, like, you Love listen, reggae. <laughs> listen to my playlist, you know, it's like, you know, I think I'm stuck in the DMX, Biggie Smalls, Dre area, but, <laughs> you know, that, all that, I personally believed made me a better person, right? It made me a better person. Um, did it make me more black? I don't think so, you know, but, you know, to me that kind of enriched my soul. And I listen to country music. I listen to all sorts of stuff. People make fun of me all the time, but, you know, it's, for me, it's great. It's great. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. And, um, lastly, just wanted to ask you if there is anything else you'd like to add, anything that we didn't cover um, that we'd really just love to share or ask. Yeah, us. <laughs> no, like, I would say, you know, like, again, as you, whatever career, it doesn't matter, medicine, law, whatever, you, journalism, hey, you know, you got to get good mentors, more importantly, very good sponsors. You need that. And you should build your cabinet, not into a lot. Of, like I said, a lot of my mentors and sponsors are not here in Seattle. They're all over the country that I rely on. And they're from varied background, varied experiences. And um, I think that's, you know, that's very critical. And another thing, you know, I think the third lesson is, you know, you got to define what success looks like for you. You got to, and, and don't give up. You know, there's, there's going to be challenges. There's going to be, you know, pitfalls, but just keep going. Just keep going until you get to where, you know, you want to be. Um, Again, you know, there's either going to, like you said, there's things going to be out of your control. There's things that are going to be within your control that doesn't work out. But, you know, again, you got to, you got to keep, you got to keep moving forward. There's so many times that people tell me you're never going to be a surgeon or you're not going to be this, or you're not going to be that. And, um, you know, I kind of filed that stuff in the back of my head and sometimes wish I could be with these people and say, Hey, 
here I am today, right? You know, and 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 one other thing that I I I, I like to sort of have a takeaway is that it's these are great personal um, accomplishments for me, but me being in this role, it's it's way bigger than me. It's way more important than me. And I often say this is me being in this role is so important for the people who believe they can't be what they can't see. Right? That is that is a very tremendous thing. And as you and Brad continue on this path, you just always gotta remember that. You know, there's a lot of people out there that wants to be see a Tiana or Brad out there, but it's not there. Right. And it's it's a very challenging to to sort of get there. So, you know, take that to heart that, you know, you guys are doing great. You guys are excellent. And there's someone behind you saying, Hey, I want to be the next Tiana. I want to be the next Brad. Just always think about that. And as you present yourself and move through your career, you are breaking down and at the same time opening doors and opportunities for others. Thank you so much. We really appreciate hearing that, really. And it's important to remember, you know, someone, as you, you know, excel and you move forward, you are opening doors and, you know, it's easy to beat up on yourself and say, oh, I wish I was here. But then you got to think about there's someone that sees where you're at that wishes they were there. And so it's all about moving forward, focusing on your goal and vision and uplifting others in the process. So thank you. That uplift others. Have to. Yes. Thank you so much. It means a lot that you shared this space with us and provided so much valuable advice. I learned so much in this conversation. So we're just very grateful. And thank you to Seattle Children's for allowing us to share your story. And um, also your story is just so inspiring. So I am, again, just thankful that you shared it with us and that we shared the space with you. Um, But yeah, we are so excited for our listeners to um, tune in in the fall. So Um, We look forward to staying in touch with you in the future. And um, thank you again. No, no. Thanks for inviting me. It's uh, like I said, it's uh, it's a pleasure and uh, nice to meet you both. And yeah, hopefully this is not just a one and done. Like you said, uh, you know, we can continue our communications and um, yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, we plan to stay in community with you. That's why we built this space. So I'm sure this will not be the last time that we speak to you. So (laughs) yeah, I'm happy to help in any way I can. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate you. Have a good Monday. Yeah, yes. have a great week. All right. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye. We are so grateful for your support and thank you for listening to Identity Unboxed. Authenticity is your guide to cast an impact on the world that you will be proud of. Signing off with pride, Tiana and Brad. Thank you so much.